The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. From an incredible hardship to an inspiring life. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, and tonight on the Agenda in the Summer, author and now professor Jesse Thistle on Finding His Way. Abandoned as a little kid, addicted in and out of prison, homeless and lost for years after that. Jesse Thistle's story is as heartbreaking as it is one of resilience and recovery. He details the path he walked to build what is now a fulfilling life in his best-selling book, From the Ashes, My Story of Being Métis, Homeless and Finding My Way. He is an assistant professor of Métis Studies at York University, and we welcome him now from his home in Hamilton, Ontario. Hi, Jesse. Hi, how are you? Pleasure to meet you, and a happy belated birthday. You turned 44 this past weekend, right? Yes, that's right. I'm an old man now. <laughs> You're just <laughs> getting started. Um, you, you know, turning 44, did you ever think that you would live to see this age live, ha after living the life that you've lived? No, no, I didn't think I'd make it out of my 20s, tell you the truth. And so to be here as a professor and a best-selling author is kind of like uh, I'm in a different world and I'm very grateful to Creator, God, Allah, whatever it is that uh, had a hand in helping me uh, to where I am today. From a very young age in the book, like the first few pages of the book, you write that, you know, from I think maybe four or five years old, you were chasing death. Um, you always had dreams of dying. It's such a young age to think about death when you're just starting to live. What caused you to have this perspective or these feelings of dying? Well, I've worked with uh, clinical psychologists uh, about my life story and, and it's the trauma and the suicidal ideation that I had from a very young age is actually tied to uh, something called adverse childhood experiences. So ACE is what they, they say. And so um, the way that me and my brothers were taken out of our home community in Saskatchewan and going through CAS and then witnessing the uh, addictions that my brother, uh, my, my father had, as well as the way that he treated my mother, he was abusive, uh, that all traumatized me. And just being raised in a city uh, in Brampton, away from my culture, my Michif and uh, Cree culture with my white family, my father's family, that was all traumatic. And so that created within me suicidal ideation, even though at the time I didn't know what it was, I would just dream of of dying uh you know i just didn't have the words to articulate what suicide was yet and but apparently that's a very common reaction to early childhood trauma and that's what i wrote about um you know the first chapter you write about what life was like with your mother's parents and i found it interesting that throughout the book we don't really hear about them again um when you look back on your life was that a time when you felt the safest or, you know, was there a reason why you didn't revisit that time? But my Musham and Cookham in Saskatchewan on the road allowance, they died soon after uh, we were put into care and then my grandparents took us in in, in Brampton. So we just never uh, got word of what happened to my Cookham and Musham because we were cut off so thoroughly from that side of my family. And mm -hmm. my grandparents in Brampton put up kind of like barriers so that we people couldn't come and see us from that side. And so we never got any information about what happened to them or any. I found that out later in my adulthood. And so I wanted to show how uh, being scooped by the system, they call it, uh, looks and also like the, the dislocation from kin structures, from land, from language, from culture, all that ca came from being disconnected from my Mushum and Cookham in their lands. What was life, you mentioned your dad, um, and you mentioned your brothers, Josh and Jerry. When it was the three of you with your dad, what was life like for you? Well, he was an addict. 
He had some serious addiction issues. He had, I believe he had some mental health issues, so he wasn't making the best decisions with an addiction and three little kids that are three, four, and five years old. And so I witnessed a lot of, you know, not good things from my dad. He would steal. He taught me and my brothers to steal. He taught us to lie to strangers, mm -hmm. taught us to hide from the authorities. Uh, all these things would manifest later in my life when, you know, I myself turn into a criminal later in my, uh, you know, a young adult life. And so those were all skills that I learned from my father early, I early on. When you, um, by the time that you moved to Ontario with your uh, grandparents, your dad's uh, family, um, what had you been taught to survive? What did you know at that time? Because you were still fairly young, but you knew a lot for your age. Yeah, I knew that like if you wanted something, you took it, you stole. And that's just, for me, that was a normal thing. Uh, if you wanted something, you lied about it and you do, did whatever. Like I, there was an incident where my grandmother in Brampton caught me red handed. I stole and I lied to her and I said that it was the drug dealing kids that that gave me the, the candy bars that I stole. And she believed it. And so I, I learned early on to manipulate. I learned the power of lying. And apparently this is too a reaction to early childhood trauma. And that's a natural reaction for some kid to take control of their life in an avenue where they don't have agency. And I did that through stealing and lying and I fought and I was a bad kid, you know, and that was all stuff that I learned early with my dad uh, and my brothers, you know, b before I was even four years old. When you were growing up in Brampton, you identified, you told people that you were Italian. Uh, did, yeah. Why did you, why were you ashamed of being Indigenous? Because your brothers um, seemed to be proud of it. Yeah, my brother, both brothers, I think, because they remembered more of Saskatchewan and my Musham and Cookham than I did. And they remembered my mom and my aunties. I think they had like a, a well-formed understanding of what Indigenous was. They didn't know that we were Cree or Métis. Uh, but they understood what quote unquote Indian was and they had a healthier understanding. Whereas me, all I knew of indigeneity was that my mom wasn't around and she was indigenous. And so I started to equate the two in bad terms. And then through basically public media, you know, uh, movies, books and stuff like that, that I was read, uh, television shows, they're all negative images of indigenous people. And so I started to internalize them growing up and other kids would tease me because they knew I was indigenous and so what made it easier what by the time I was entering my early teens was to just tell everybody that my parents had died and that I was Italian and I tried to even like watch Goodfellas and like <laughs> the untouchables these are the movies that were out there were about Italian people back then within their negative stereotypes too but I started to internalize all this stuff right and that was my defense was just to lie about it and say that I was Italian and it worked for a while until I got a little older and then the the competing uh, idea of not really knowing who I was as an indigenous person was so deep seated that it became very, very destructive and led to some experimentations with drugs and whatnot. So we're going to get into that. And um, I just wanted to uh, read something that you wrote about how you got started uh, doing drugs. Uh, you first you got into hash, then acid, cocaine, and then you tried some harder stuff. Um, and here's how you described trying crack for the first time. You write, when I released my lung full of crack like a dragon blasting a plume of fire on some medieval castle, the most intense feeling vibrated my brain. I could hear the loudest ringing I've ever heard, like a locomotive train rushing by an inch from my ear. I placed the can down and the void within was filled to overflowing. I felt like a god, superhuman. Like a hundred thousand Roman candles were going off in my soul. When that initial high dissipated, I did it again and again. Then I got, up, I got down on all fours to search the ca carpet for any remnants that might have fallen. My buddies did the same. We kept searching. You know, hearing that and, you know, you got that high, but there were consequences. What was happening to your body and to your mind once you started doing this? Well, I became hooked right away. That gives me uh, addictions, cravings right now. I want to go use the washroom. Just hearing that, like the body reacts. And so I think because I had already had a lot of trauma 
from my childhood. And then my grandfather was, uh, I guess they would say he was abusive, but that he was just being a disciplinarian. He was old school and that's what he knew. Mm -hmm. All that trauma was coming to me. And so by the time I got into the harder drugs where I could actually control how I felt and control my, my perceptions of the world around me, then I was already primed for addiction. It's actually a fallacy or a myth that it, the crack is so addictive, you do it once and then you become an addict. That's not true. I had years of cocaine addiction before that, years of MDMA addiction, ketamine, everything I was doing. And then to top it off at the end of all that, with the trauma, I did crack and then I was already primed for addiction and I became a, a, an addict just after that first hit and I just continued to use and that became my life and it actually literally transformed my body you know I went from a healthy uh I don't know handsome young man and to like this skinny addict who stole and lied and I became what I became and so but it all started from like early on early childhood trauma that I had yeah when you when you were doing this and um, you, your grandfather would talk about your dad, um, what were you trying to escape when you got deeper and deeper into the drug culture? Well, I tried to escape my past. I tried to escape what had happened to me and my brothers. I tried to escape the memory of my, my missing father, presumed to be murdered in 1982. Uh, the trauma of watching my grandparents, you know, that was their firstborn son and how it broke them as people. And I felt so sorry for them. I love my grandparents very dearly. And so me using was a way to escape all that. It was escape. It was a way to numb not knowing who I was as an indigenous person. It was kind of like my my everything balm, you know, just like over all my issues that I had over all my problems, I just retreated into addiction and it got rid of it for a time. For a time it worked. But, you know, as we know, these things come at a high cost. And uh, soon enough, the, the costs started to damage me psychologically, physically, and like uh, literally almost killed me. What, are the, what were some of those costs? Well, I almost lost my leg because uh, I fell off a building and it got really, really infected. And, uh, you know, I didn't listen to the doctors and that's what happens after major surgery. I didn't have a home. So my body wasted away from just malnutrition and never having the proper things to survive. I lost the ability really to take care of myself uh, because you learn these skills as a child. And if you don't practice them because you have no residence to, you know, wash your clothes, wash yourself, uh, take care of groceries, I lost all those skills. And so that's the erosion of my physical, then my habitual, my, my, my memory. And then at my core, it really eroded my mental health to the point where like I thought I was in psychosis uh, for many years and like I acted that way. I would say I would maybe even borderline sociopathic and I've talked to my uh, my um, therapist about it, and she doesn't think that, but I do. You know, there was just some things that I, I got into that I just didn't think of other people. It was just about me as the addict, right? And during this time, you got into trouble with the law uh, because you were committing crime. Um, and you had a lot of experience with uh, the police. During this, you know, we're having a, um, a global conversation around the Black Lives Matter movement um, about uh, police brutality uh, towards Indigenous people, people of color. Um, how would you describe the interactions that you had with police during this time? Well, I can't speak for everybody else. I can only speak to my own uh, experiences. But what I realized when I was on the streets, I had police that broke my wrist, that cracked my throat, you know, but I also had police that would stand and sit with me and try to talk sense to me. Or they would arrest me when it was like negative 30 below and let me stay in the bullpen. And so I realized that police or the institution of policing is populated with people and some of them are good, and they're there for the right reasons, and some of them are bad, and they're there for a paycheck, or because they don't know what else to do with themselves because they have no uh, career opportunity elsewhere. And so those bad people, I believe, are, are being infected by this toxic culture within policing uh, that, you know, subjugates people of uh, color and indigenous people and harms them. And so I believe that if we repopulate the institution of policing, 
with people that have the right intentions that we can see fundamental institutional change. But until that happens, you know, I don't know if things will change. And I, I believe that what's happening now is correct. We need to apply pressure. We need to look at the issue differently. We need to defund a lot of things that police are taking care of and, and offset that cost to different institutions. So, yeah, it's a complicated thing because, like, on page 270, you see my interactions with the police, but then I have these other positive poli uh, interactions. My brother became an RCMP. My uncle was a cop. And so I have a very... I guess humanistic, you know, individual uh, view of the way police are today. I mean, I think people, a lot of people have assumptions about people they've never met uh, in person, including people in prison. Um, when you were uh, in jail, what did jail teach you about the people who were there, uh, about the human beings that you were sharing uh, cell space with? Well, I learned that they're, they're not all bad. Right. And there are some people there that are victims of, uh, quote unquote, justice, just us for white people. Uh, there weren't a lot of white people in jail. You know, it was mainly indigenous and black uh, when I was in there, unfortunately. And a lot of them actually were really good, really intelligent people that maybe made one mistake or the turn of the law worked in such a way that they got caught up in it. But most, like I learned to read and write basically in jail. I learned to be a good person from my cellmate, Loriston, who taught me the value of sharing. I learned to, you know, brotherhood and fellowship in jail. So a lot of really positive uh, lessons that I took with me for the rest of my life. You know, I learned from people in there and like I miss those people, as odd as that sounds. Um, you spent a lot of time on the street, you lived in a car for a little bit with your friend Leroy, and uh, here's how you, you describe uh, the toll homelessness took on you after living on the street for a very long time. You write, I didn't recognize much anymore, not music or movies or anything. Signs blurred into smears of jumbled incomprehension. Faces too, I was a wild animal, a stray wolf with matted fur covered in filth, one not even a dog catcher would want to mess with. The world screamed past me. I lived amongst the Ewok shadows. I groaned misery and shifted as they did. I longed to be part of something again, to be known and accepted, to hear my name. No one ever said my name anymore. I stomped forward on the bench and held my head in my hands, trying to remember how my name sounded. You know, I know reading the book, um, I know you wrote the words, but hearing them, I know there's an amount of trauma, and I, and I hope it's okay that I've been doing this. Um, going from that passage, who you were and what your life used to look like at that moment, did you remember any of it? Yeah, I do. I do remember segments. Uh, when you're traumatized, you, you become like a time traveler in a lot of ways. Your brain gets written into that trauma. So neurons form, and you kind of... You think that in real time that it's happening now. Your brain does anyways when you remember and you try to re And so when I look at my mind, it's like these fragments of trauma where I'm actually, I travel through time right to that time period. And I sometimes I can't turn that off. And that's the work of that, right? Uh, the stuff that I shared in my books, uh, my book was the stuff that I could share. There's other stuff that I kept back that I just didn't talk about. How close did you come to forgetting who you were? Oh, all the time. Very close. I, th I think I died out there like a thousand times almost. Like I must have. Parts of me died for sure. Overdosed and just being forgotten. And so very always walking close to death the whole time, walking close to forgetting myself the whole time. And it's just like vague memories of childhood or, you know, hearing my name sometimes when I would go into like uh, intake at a shelter. That would keep me going and say, oh, I am I am a human, I am a person, I, I do have a name and I do come from a place and I have a family. And, I, you know, in those moments, that's what kept me going, you know, as well as the kindness of strangers, actually. You know, a lot of strangers love me, tried to love me back into the circle when I was wandering around and forgot who I was. At one point, you intentionally get yourself arrested. Why would you do that? Well... 
I guess the macro analysis of it is because society cares more about criminals than they do about homeless people. And I didn't have a place to go. And I, I had gotten a major infection in my leg and I was afraid of losing my leg. And so I committed a crime because I was desperate and I didn't know where else to go. And I knew about the justice system. I knew about food. I knew about having a place to rest and, you know, recouping which was better than wandering around in the shelter system where nobody even cared at all. And so, yeah, that's what I did. I robbed uh, a 7-Eleven in Brampton, and I, I think I did it subconsciously now when I look back at, it, back at it retrospectively. It seems like a conscious decision, but I think it was just reactionary. And uh, I knew that I would be safer and that I would be able to keep my leg and survive inside. And that was something that after that initial incident, I, I continued to break the law so that I would be arrested and go back and try to get my education and whatnot. Uh, eventually, you ended up in rehab. And in rehab, reading the pages of what you the uh, the process that you went through you were basically living minute you were making decisions minute by minute um, but during rehab you had to relearn a lot of things you took an etiquette class what did you learn in that class well i learned to talk to people and not interrupt them so listen and when they finish then i start to talk you know that's quite a bit different than the way i was reacting on the streets and communicating i learned how to like brush my teeth and comb my hair and take care of myself harvest house taught me those things that was the rehab i was at in the etiquette course i learned how to like fill out a resume and search for jobs i learned how to eat at a table with a fork and knife and just basically relearn how to take care of myself because I, I those skills had been eroded for so long and uh, yeah, in many ways, that that etiquette course and what I learned at Harvest House really saved my life back and to be to the realm of being able to take care of myself again. Uh, you eventually got into York University program that allowed you to research Métis history, do field work in Saskatchewan, and interview elders. Um, how did that impact you on a personal level and your recovery? Well, it was it was everything. It was everything. Um, when I went back, there was like a whole community of elders, uh, my relatives that were there waiting for me, basically to come back and rediscover who I was as a Métis Cree person. I went back with my doctoral supervisor and I uh, interviewed all elders in my community that had uh, ancestors from the 1885 Northwest Resistance. And when I went back and I talked to them, and I heard that there were other people like me from my generation from that were my age that didn't know who they were. It was kind of like, I have the keys to understand my own trauma. I understand that I'm part of a larger sociological push of dispossession in this country that ended with my generation and intergenerational trauma fraying away the edges of our community and our kids got lost into adoption. And so when I went back, I learned all about that. And... It was a, it created like a fellowship and it gave me back a sense of my identity where I wasn't afraid. I learned that, hey, it's, it's actually really cool to be Indigenous. It's, it's not all about my trauma story. It's about like my culture, my language, connection to land, elders, learning my history, all these wonderful, wonderful things. I learned that by going back and researching my family and my people's history. And now I share it. I broadcast it from the top of mountaintops to the rest of the world as much as I can, because in knowing our history, we can understand our traumas, right? And I'm not the only one that needed to understand that there are other people uh, who similarly have gone through Scoop that also need to hear uh, my story and how I made my way back. You, in the book, you have um, a picture of your father at the back of it, uh, asking people if they have information to get in touch. You haven't seen your dad, I think, since you were three. If you were to see him now or talk to him, what would you say? Well, I'd probably punch him out, I think. Uh, that'd be the first reaction. I'd probably get in a big fist fight with the guy and just call him every name in the book. And then I'd probably just give him a big hug and tell him I'm missing him. I love him and ask him where he's been what happened you know if he remembers himself or me and then i would take the years and years and years until he died uh helping him remember you know because i think that he was suffering from his own intergenerational trauma and that he just didn't couldn't cope and addiction was his way just like it was mine 
as generations of men in my family have uh, found addictions to be a, a safe uh, haven from trauma. I would help him understand his trauma, and then I would uh, make him feel loved at the end of it. Really, that this is what this story is about. It's about a quest to find love, family love, love of culture, love of self, love of creator, and to love society instead of hurting it. And that's really the... And I, I put that at the end of the book because... There's a part of me that's asking everyone who buys to look for him to help our family heal because we need closure, you know, and that's why his book, that's there, sorry. Uh, no, no, um, you say that in some ways the pain has been a blessing. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, the pain in my foot, because my foot never healed properly from my fall and subsequent operation and then all the drama with me having to rob, rob the story never healed. And so... Every time I walk downstairs or with my wife or anywhere, I get a, sh a jolt of pain that goes up my foot. And so when I wake up in the morning, it's the worst. So my first step on the ground, really, really sore. And I always have to remember, this is a gift from Creator to remind me of the person that I was, not the person I am today. And to remember that the fall from my brother's window was real, my prior life as distance as it sounds or feels is just around the corner it's a few decisions away and so that pain is a reminder to be grateful of all that i have today it's a blessing in in many ways and it's like a prayer every time i step it's uh, i've heard other people uh, that are religious talk about uh, pain in similar ways so i see it that way and that helps me cope at the beginning of your book, you said that, you know, as a child, uh, the elders around you were worried that you couldn't talk, um, but you said that you knew how to speak, but the words were yours. Those words were yours, so you kept them to yourself. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for writing this book and for sharing your words with us, because I think it's going to allow a lot of people to heal and a lot of people to just, you know, you were written off and the life that you've created. Um, I just want to say it's, it's just an incredible story and congratulations uh, for all the hard work that you've uh, done. Because I know you've thanked a lot of other people, but I think um, if you hadn't pushed yourself, believed in yourself a little bit, you might not be here today. So thank you, Jesse. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nam. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Namki Wanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.